This program is brought to you by Emory University. Thank you all. This panel is uh, entitled First Amendment Today, and we're going to be exploring some areas of recent and potential movement in the area of First Amendment law. Uh, I will be introducing our speakers, whose full bios are obviously in your program. Uh, from my right to my far right, spatially as opposed to politically. And uh, the, our speakers today are Gene Stefanik and Richard Delgado of the University of Alabama School of Law. Uh, Jane Bambar from uh, Arizona College of Law. Tajander Singh from Goldstein and Russell and then Professor Volokh of UCLA will be providing some commentary on the prior speakers. Gene and I would like to thank Dean Chemerinsky from the uh, panel just before lunch. Uh -huh. Better? Gene and I would like to thank Dean Chemerinsky from the panel just before lunch for, for mention, mentioning uh, a couple of, of pieces that we did uh, on behalf of Latino school children in Tucson, Arizona, who, on whom the authorities of that state de descended with full force uh, because they were taking Mexican-American studies in the, uh, in the public schools of, of Tucson, a uh, course of instruction that included courses in, in American literature, uh, Chicano literature, um, a history of the, of the Southwest, and so on, in, in a way that the authorities thought um, uh, were, was inculcating the kids with a bad attitude toward, toward this, uh, this, this wonderful country. Uh, one sidelight is, is that, that we had a, 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 not just a scholarly stake in the, in the controversy because of general interest, but uh, also a personal one because uh, two, two books of ours were, were banned in Arizona, uh, boxed up from the, from the schools when the order came down from on high and taken off to a, to a book depository outside, outside of ta uh, town. Uh, we were, uh, our books weren't the only ones <clears throat> that were uh, banned in Arizona. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, Occupied America by uh, Rodolfo Acuna, uh, the preeminent Chicano historian is, uh, is another. Howard Zinn's uh, People's History of the United States and also taught them the wrong attitude toward, toward the, the country. Uh, Sandra Cisneros's House on Mango uh, Street. And um, Five, 500 years of Chicano history in pictures by Elizabeth Martinez. Right. Okay. And last, uh, William Shakespeare's The, the Tempest, which uh, had, some, uh, <clears throat> had some snide things to say about colonialism, which the authorities were all apparently in, fa in favor of. So we, we, have a, we have a stake in, the, in a strong fir First Amendment, even though today we will uh, inveigh against First Amendment formalism. Anyway, uh, we, we plan to tell you a bit about our draft paper for the Law Review and, and also read you a short portion from it. From it. The, the paper, as mentioned, is about First Amendment legal formalism and its consequences and builds on two earlier pieces on the, on the same subject that I, I published in Harvard Law Review and Harvard Civil Rights, Civil Liberties Law Review not too long ago. These earlier articles point out how legal realism swept through the law like a breath of fresh air in the early decades of, of, this, uh, of the last century, paving the way for, uh, for several forms of new legal scholarship and freeing judges to consider a host of factors, including social policy, balancing, changes in the composition of the citizenry, and the economic impact of one legal rule versus, uh, versus another. Uh, all for the better, most people think, I, me too. Uh, this revolution, however, bypassed one area um, uh, alone, the, the, the First Amendment, where bright line rules, doctrinal boxes, and cliches such as the best, cure, best response to bad speeches, more speech, continue to hold sway. Okay, can you hear me in the back? Mm -hmm. We okay? Okay, our article for this journal builds on Richard's two papers and a third in Cornell that we published together some years ago, and it goes on to do two things. 
We use recent uh, federal district court cases that struck down our campus hate speech codes and as well as two Supreme Court decisions having to do with cross burning to show how lingering First Amendment formalism can impede the development of a system of rules for mitigating some of the tensions inherent in uh, an increasingly multiracial society, and it's a poor practice for that reason. And second, our article extends our critique of First Amendment formalism to the realm of legislative and popular deliberation about controversial topics, in particular immigration policy in the South, where it operates paradoxically to suppress and reduce the quality of speech and debate. Since we imagine you're more interested in this second part of the article than in the first, about hate speech law, uh, we'll give you a small portion of the part about the inhibiting effect of First Amendment formalism on deliberation in legislative chambers, but also in barbershops and newspaper editorials and elsewhere throughout the South, all centering on the wave of Latino immigration that started in the early 1990s. Um, some of the most draconian laws that we have seen since Jim Crow went out of fashion uh, and crested shortly, uh, not too long ago. Uh, so we are going to uh, give you part of the paper now, okay? Uh, to understand why the South responded <clears throat> with such reflexive animosity when Latinos began arriving in 1990, one needs to go back to a time about 150 years earlier. In the period just before the Civil War, 1850 to 1860, the South felt beleaguered. Its slave economy was highly profitable, enabling the ruling class to build palatial homes, plantations, lead lives of leisure, and so on. But the North, for the most part, detested slavery, did, did not want it to spread to new areas. During that time, the country's main population growth was occurring in the North, so that the balance of political power was uh, poised to shift decisively toward that region, spelling disaster for the South and its way of life. Slavery's days were numbered, together with the wealth and grand houses that they brought Writing was on the wall. This left the South with only two alternatives seriously considered, secession, of course, or expanding, expanding the number of slave states. When the North headed off expansion of slavery to new territories such as Kansas, Southern politicians and adventurers in a little known chapter cast their eyes on Latin America and the Caribbean, seeing in them a promising source of new land, slaves, votes, and representation, if only they could conquer these areas and add them as new states. Southern politicians envisioned as many as 25 new American states, carving them out of Cuba, Nicaragua, Honduras, and southern Mexico, the northern part having already been conquered by the United States in the war with Mexico, also, they had their eyes on Yucatan, Sonora, and other places down south. They thus encouraged and, and funded private and semi-private expeditions aimed at taking over some of these lands and establishing American, that is to say, southern rule. These regions, once admitted to the Union, would naturally align with the Confederacy, as it was to be uh, named, in its struggle against northern abolitionists, such as Abraham Lincoln, they would, in short, be just like the new states of California and Utah, Colorado, Kansas, and so on, territories of New Mexico and Arizona, only they would be slaveholding rather than free. Emboldened by southern rhetoric depicting the region as a gold mine occupied by simple, indolent, brown-skinned people, waiting for the arrival of virile, energetic Americans, one adventurer named William Walker led an expeditionary force that conquered Nicaragua, whereupon he named himself 
president of that country, ruling for a year before being deposed and hung by the indignant Central Americans who turned out to be not so lazy and docile after all. First, however, he reinstituted slavery, which that country had long ago abandoned in its laws. He also made English the official language of Nicaragua. I'm not making this up. This is called the filibuster movement, for you if they are interested in, in this period. Another adventurer named John Quitman, a former Southern governor, invaded Cuba several times never successfully, but always hopeful and always well-armed and equipped. Many other would-be conquerors schemed to take over other regions that were still unspoken for, raising considerable sums of money from wealthy planters or businessmen, chartering vessels, buying weaponry, and setting out with flags flying. Newspaper editors, preachers, many other opinion makers offered staunch support. College students caught the fervor and considered dropping out to enlist in the exciting foreign ventures. Many did. The region was aflame with excitement over Southern expansion. It is almost impossible to convey the sense of excitement that swept that region over the idea of conquest in the tropics. Because of poor planning and a long supply chain and strong resistance from the natives, most of these unofficial invasions failed. It would have taken state militias many thousands strong to do that job. But the South soon had more troubles on its hands in the form of an upstart Yankee president and soon a civil war and a Union army that turned out to be both more effective and rapacious than the Southern saber rattlers had any reason to expect. Southern dreams of empire thus came to an end with the war, in which the South ended up soundly defeated and in ruins. But the region's dreams did not entirely die, nor did the attitudes and the rhetoric that the South deployed during that 10-year period, when speakers and editors, politicians, and ordinary people geared up for a push southward into Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central America. Rather, these ideas hibernated in culturally encoded forms aphorisms, jokes, cartoons, insider comments, folk beliefs. They are little less explicit than the anti-black attitudes that doomed Reconstruction, more like the anti-Indian feelings that break out periodically today in liberal states like Wisconsin and Washington, where working class whites unleash vicious anti-Indian slurs and attacks over fishing rights or Indian hunting, even casino instruction. Thus, when thousands of brown-skinned people from south of the border started to appear in the American South, beginning shortly uh, before NAFTA and increasing greatly after NAFTA went into effect, they were attracted by the benign climate and jobs in farm work and construction, furniture factories, forestry, hospitality industry, and the, the region lashed out against them, even though tolerating them would have seemed to have made sense, at least in self-interest. The cultural memory of an earlier period, when the South saw brown people as indolent, hypersexual, and feeble-minded, lived on in the cultural memory and formed a basis for resistance that is otherwise very hard to explain. When Southerners say, or think, as some of them do, <clears throat> that the South will rise again, they emphatically don't mean Mexico, Cuba, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Honduras, Puerto Rico, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic. And they don't want too many expatriates from those countries making a living, prospering, sending their kids to school, romancing white women, and chattering away in their ridiculous language in our once proud region. But for a twist of fate, we might be ruling, might have been ruling them one today. By rights, we ought to be. We, in short, ought to be there in the state house, surrounded by palm trees, issuing edicts and orders and collecting taxes. Not them here. That, in brief, is our is our thesis. <laughs> 
attitudes formed during this earlier period programmed a sort of dog whistle in the memorable phase of Ian Haney Lopez and sensitized southern ears to, uh, to hear and react to just this frequency. Countervailing arguments were simply not heard. The South learned that the Latinos were, were coming, and with that, they had heard enough. Indeed, some of these present-day speakers deemed themselves virtuous in advocating harsh treatment of the, of the, of the Latinos, like uh, the uh, state, state laws that penalize practically anything an um, immigrant might want to do, rent, a, rent an apartment, get a job, get a ride from a friend, go to church, um, and so on. Like the, the, the knights and the would-be che uh, chevaliers of the eight, 1850s who sallied forth in defense of region, home, and ladies' honor, copies of novels by Sir Walter Scott in their backpacks, some even called themselves the Knights of the Golden Circle, some present-day Southern advocates of anti-immigration rules convinced themselves that they were doing so in defense of blacks. Immigrants take black jobs, they reasoned, quite incorrectly. Black's life, a lot in life, is hard enough. We must keep the Latinos out. They, they just, uh, they do something. They lower, lower wages for everybody, particularly the ones at the bottom of the social hierarchy. There's no such thing as a black job, however. And to the extent to which African Americans tend to gravitate cer towards certain kinds of work, those are not the ones that the new immigrants are interested in, at least right now. All studies show that the regions experiencing immigration show a, a rise in, in wealth, jobs, and economic well-being. Crime and unemployment also drop. There are new jobs for everyone, including crew chiefs for the sectors that are now filling up with Latino workers, restaurants, uh, yard work, and so on. The, the new workers, of course, struggle with English. The crew chief, by contrast, needs to speak that language in, or, in order to deal with the higher-ups and to order materials and supplies and to talk with outside authorities. And the crew chief can be either black or white or even third-generation Latino. These new supervisor jobs are a net gain for everyone in the, in the region, people of all colors, and represent, of course, um, a huge net gain in the, uh, for, the, for the economy in that, in that re region. As the New York Times reported uh, recently, they contributed $100 billion to the social security system, warding off collapse, but will never receive a cent in benefits. At the state and local level, they contributed $11 billion in the form of taxes in 2010 alone. Inveighing against the Im uh, immigrants, then, is, is bad politics for progressive people, including ones, including ones who dedicate their lives to the black cause, for a second reason. The Republican Party currently desires to cut welfare payments to blacks, in part in order to lower taxes for all, but also because Southern legislat legislators would like the blacks once again to fill jobs like working in the soil, shining shoes, or working as servants in white households. That state of affairs would feel familiar, comfortable, and right to many power brokers in the South who would like to reestablish that situation as soon as possible. It strikes them as familiar and, and just, and they detest the idea of blacks idling away their time at home, not working, but surviving on welfare payments. Unemployment is generally high in the South, even in service industries at the bottom of the occupational ladder. For that plan, the, what we call the new Southern strategy, to succeed, there must be a substantial pool of unfilled jobs as hotel maids, janitors, gardeners, agricultural field workers, and, and assembly line jobs in poultry pro processing plants, so that the African Americans, once welfare disappears, will have some place to go and work. But if these jobs are filled by eager, diligent Latino workers pleased to have them as a means of escape from desperate conditions back home, the African Americans will have no, nowhere to go once the welfare payments end. This state of affairs may well be giving some Republicans in the, in the South and elsewhere pause. Not only does it inter interfere with the plans that these leaders have for blacks, the new Southern strategy, it does not seem normal 
the Latinos, in effect, like the work too much. In the South, work is supposed to be hard and sweaty and something that one endures and not enjoys. The South has been a region with very little infrastructure for the simple reason that with slavery, one did not need it. Infrastructure, that is roads, steam engines, railroads, machines that lifted, moved, and processed things, was unnecessary for a long time. One had slave labor, which was cheaper, and the dominant crops were labor intensive and did not lend themselves to mechanization, except for the cotton gin. For this reason, the South today offers relatively little work in high-tech industries, but much still in mining, forestry, poultry, and other forms of meat processing, furniture manufacturing, all requiring hard, hands-on labor. But few machines or computers are certainly not robots. And of course, unionization is unthinkable. Workers are supposed to keep their minds on their work, not on possibilities for collective action and better conditions. Because many of the jobs that the South needs to fill are unattractive now to black people because of the work's association with slavery, today they are reluctant to fill them unless they are faced with destitution, which may easily happen if conservative Southern legislatures eliminate social welfare, which of course some would like to do. The Latinos, however, stand in the way of this master plan. We analyze this dynamic and its political implications more fully in our article and a future one about racial politics and the new Southern strategy that we're actually working on now as well. Our point is not that this is the, uh, this, this is not the only way to think about the issue of resistance to Latino immigration to the South. Rather, it is that most, if not all, of these considerations were entirely missing they're missing from the debate about it. First Amendment formalism facilitated the truncated discourse that we saw after the Latinos arrived. It encouraged a habit of mind that is prone to decide vital issues by means of snap judgments, slogans, as we heard earlier in the day, and cursory analysis. Oh yes, Mexicans, I know about them. It made a harsh result seem tolerable by creating a climate in which the group whose fortunes were at stake deserved no better were, about that too. were vilified, demonized, depicted as thoroughly unworthy of living in our beloved region, which is where the part about uh, in the article where hate speech comes in. In short, the attitudes that the South acquired toward Caribbean, Mexican, and Central American people during the expeditionary period, 1850 to 1860, largely determined how Southern people responded to the large wave of Latino immigrants who began arriving in the mid-1990s. Why do we suspect that it's the same set of attitudes formed during the earlier period that are surfacing today, or close relatives of them? The answer is that the, these early attitudes cropped up in the intervening period with great regularity in everyday thought in, in politics, as well as in the literature and popular culture of the region. Between 1865 and, and, and today, 50. 50, okay. Sorry. Me, today the, the South uh, d despised brown-skinned brown uh, Latino people, more or less continuously, even though between and then and now they had relatively little direct contact with many of them. In short, the anti-Latino attitudes, ambitions, and rhetoric that sprang up in the, in the South with the campaign for so Southward Empire hibernated over the interim, occasionally breaking out into the open. The current nativist posture of the South turns out to be rooted in previous thought and practice, in particular dreams of empire stemming back to a period just before the Civil War and bound up with it. The Southern distaste for Latinos could also have contained traces of anti-Catholic sentiment and, and even Islamophobia. The South has always been an intensely religious region, the Bible Belt, but its religiosity has been confined to a, a small number of uh, forms, particularly a rather intense variant of evangelical Protestantism. Many slaves, however, were mus Muslim and literate, both of which posed serious challenges to the Southern order. When the South learned that the Haitians and Dominicans practiced Santeria, voodoo, and even Islam, 
they must have been equally horrified. And their disdain knew no bounds when they realized that practically all of Latin America, including the very countries that they coveted as new states or territories, including Mexico, Honduras, and Nicaragua, were deeply Catholic. Travel literature, soldiers' letters, and other accounts show that many travelers and expeditionaries connected Latin Americans' supposed laziness, docility, and lack of initiative with their religion. The racial attitudes that the South formed during slavery then combined with religious righteousness and fervor in a fashion that justified and naturalized hierarchy, dominion, and control. When Southern patriarchs set their eyes on conquering Latin America in the years leading up to the Civil War, their motivation must have been, in their minds, both benign and com complex to cure the, the, the region's residents of their mistaken ways and to persuade them to embrace the right ones, namely slavery and Christianity in that order. 100 years later, when hapless Latino workers descended on the region, looking for work in the area's farms and meat packing plants, they must have evoked then a double dose of bigotry. Most were Catholic, and they were failed Confederates in slavery, reminders of an inglorious past when the region almost, but not quite, saved itself through conquest of lands even further south. The region rejected Latino immigrants in the modern era because they were out of place in more ways than one. Southern agents and rulers by rights should have been there in their countries governing them, not the other way around, not they, the sweaty proletariat here. Their natural role was to play the obedient subject, not free people striding along the sidewalk, singing, playing guitars, eyeing the local women, speaking their incomprehensible language, eating their exotic spicy food. Certainly, parts of the South are nursing a sense of grievance over the war of nor Northern aggression, even 150 years later, and prone to laying uh, the blame for its condition on anyone handy. But the one that we have named and described is, in our view, the main one, the main reason, and the most parsimonious. In conclusion, then, we find a disconcerting amount of evidence of first order and second order First Amendment formalism in legislative and policymaking circles, where it does a great deal of harm by rendering vital discussion short, angry, and routinized prone to end with a foregone conclusion as soon as a speaker plays a single trump card such as, but they are illegal, or they might be carrying disease, or they take black jobs, whatever that means. Formalism also focuses attention on the here and now, even though key meanings and associations may originate well in the past. And if it also enables certain elements of society to construct an unflattering image of certain speakers, then policy discussions can be quicker and easier because who would want to listen to a tedious argument from people who are not our intellectual equals? In fact, even though we don't make this point in our article, we hazard just for the purpose of discussion here today that First Amendment formalism and racism connect and reinforce each other in a fourth way, namely on a psychological and developmental level for many persons, not all certainly. Racism, you see, is a kind of formalism since it divides up the world into a small number of categories of people with important differences, supposedly among them. Those differences are not biological in any interesting or important respect. Instead, most social scientists now believe that race is purely a social construction. The main tool of that construction is, of course, speech the way we talk about a people and agree that they are this way or that way and assign them to various categories to suit our purposes at the time. To see the connection between the two types of formalism, consider that the drafters of the Constitution made express provision for the institution of slavery, building in four to six, depending on how you count, clauses whose purpose or effect was to continue that institution for some time. They made no provision for the First Amendment. They didn't have to. 
at least with blacks, they had coercion. So there was no need for social construction, narratives, stereotypes, and media images, and other slow-acting mechanisms. Power, guns, whips, did that quite nicely. With the Indians, muskets, artillery, the doctrine of discovery were sufficient. And with women, tradition was all on men's side. Most women in the late 1700s did the men's bidding, or if they didn't, realize that for the time being, at least, they were outnumbered and likely to lose every debate. By the time the country enacted the Bill of Rights, however, the slavery clauses, some of them at least, were approaching their sunset period, 1808, so that replacement mechanisms might be necessary within a few decades, particularly if the abolitionists had their way. Speech would have to do clumsier, but just as effective. And so, many of the same people passed the Bill of Rights with the First Amendment and the honorary first chair. So, if you have ever noticed, as we have, a slightly dogmatic, insistent, and even shrill tone about some of the writings of First Amendment absolutists in the discussion, for example, of hate speech codes, there you are. Bruno Bettelheim, Theodore Adorno, and the authoritarian personality were writing with their type in mind. And if we're right, so were Frederick Douglass and John Brown. So I'm going to talk a bit about the clash between privacy rights and the First Amendment, which of course has been bedeviling courts for quite a while and will continue to do so. But I'm going to explore just a narrow, discrete topic within the larger mess of, of privacy law. Um, so here it is. What can the law do within the bounds of the First Amendment if a person wishes to avoid learning something, particularly if it's about himself? So what if a person doesn't want to discover that his father is not biologically related to him? What if a, a person does not want to be reminded that she had had a miscarriage or doesn't want to know that she will die from Huntington's disease, a, a, an, an incurable degenerative disease? So this, this interest in freedom from thought is intriguing to me for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, it captures a form of privacy that's easier to defend in, in many ways than, than other traditional forms of privacy uh, because those other traditional forms give full control to the information subject so that I can stop you from talking about me to other people. Whereas this form, the form I'm talking about today, is much more limited. It's only limiting you from talking about me to me, back to me. Right? So supporting this kind of an interest in self-ignorance uh, might disrupt only the sorts of, of communications and information flows that aren't so troubling to disrupt anyways. After all, if, if someone want, doesn't want to know something about themselves, then a transgression seems entirely wasteful. You know, it, it, it puts the listener in a worse position, and it presumably does very little good to the speaker. So the second reason I wanted to write about it, though, was to challenge my own philosophical commitments and, and assumptions, because ordinarily I'm, I'm a very strong supporter of freedom of information flow. And so I wanted the chance to think through an area where maybe more information is actually foreseeably going to make things worse. Uh, so, so I'm going to explore lawmaking that could theoretically support a person's interest in staying self-ignorant uh, and to see whether they can, can be consonant with, with the First Amendment. Uh, so, before I do, let me, let me talk a bit about my methods. Uh, I, can't, I, I don't have the opportunity to start from scratch with first principles about uh, free speech law, uh, and I'm not sure I'd want to do so anyway, but I also need something a, a bit more nuanced than the simple crude rule that all speech restrictions, uh, or speech restrictions that discriminate on the basis of, a, basis of content receive exacting strict scrutiny. Uh, after all, all the laws that I'm anticipating here would regulate on the basis of content, so, so that kind of simple rule would, would level and flatten all the most interesting terrain and, and, um, and ignore areas where law actually can and frequently does regulate speech without provoking the strongest form of, of scrutiny and mistrust from the courts. So I'm going to take advantage of, of some middle-range models advanced by uh, Professor Volek and also by James Grimmelman. So the, the main insight is pretty simple. Uh, when law 
cuts off the communication between a willing speaker and a willing listener, that's when the courts should be the most skeptical and demand the, the, the most, uh, you know, the clearest justification from, from the government. The willing speaker, willing listener combo is at the heart of protection. So if you buy that, uh, we can start to distinguish this from other types of communications. Uh, so if a speaker is communicating to multiple listeners, some of whom are willing listeners, uh, or at least, at least some of them might be willing listeners, uh, then this one-to-many communication also must receive, receive the strong form of, of, of speech protection since it contains that precious willing-to-willing -willing combination. If, however, the speaker is communicating only to one listener, and that listener is an involuntary participant, then this willing speaker, unwilling listener combination falls somewhere outside the central core zone of, of speech protection, and the government will have a little more leeway to protect the preferences of, of that unwilling listener. Uh, so harassing phone calls, for example, to a, to a, uh, a person uh, should be uh, more easily regulated than a blog post that criticizes and insults the, the victim. So with that set up, let's consider laws that protect the listener from, from learning something about himself. They aren't common, but they do exist. Uh, for example, many states, uh, uh, many states uh, prevent doctors from screening and revealing HIV uh, status unless the patient explicitly consents uh, to the test. So this approach of checking first and then complying with the preferences um, crops up all the time in, in social norms and, and ethics too. So ge the genomics research community, for example, uh, developed an elaborate set of protocols to warn research subjects that they might learn something unexpected about their health or their family uh, before they got involved in the, in the research. And for a while, these researchers even strongly preferred not to return negative health results, uh, despite the fact that the subject may have, may have been able to um, engage in preventative care or, um, or in some other way improve uh, their health. This norm has changed a bit over, over time in the intervening years, but at the time it was a very strong ethic. So I can imagine legislatures growing more interested in a law that, that, that um, builds in these kinds of protections, especially as it becomes increasingly easy for people who aren't doctors and aren't fiduciaries to learn very personal things about each other. So for example, I can imagine the government wanting to regulate 23andMe and other, other um, genomic sequencing uh, companies from, uh, from, from giving information to their clients without first receiving explicit consent, um, or at least certain types of information that the consumer might not be expecting to learn about. However, a strong consent requirement, like the one I'm talking about, uh, can only avoid strict, the strict form of speech scrutiny <clears throat> if the communication is one-to-one. -one. Doctor-patient conversations are certainly one-to-one, -one, but if 23andMe sent out a communication to all of its clients whose DNA sequence contains some particular type of gene, um, that communication would be one to many, and it plausibly, uh, in fact, likely, uh, some of the recipients would enjoy hearing from, uh, would enjoy hearing the communication. Uh, so the same analysis, by the way, applies to um, the stories you may have heard about w women who receive promotional material about uh, pregnancy right after they've had a miscarriage. Uh, so while this experience is understandably distressing and horrible for them, uh, the mailing is distributed, of course, to many other women who have not miscarried and uh, who may welcome the communication that they received. So is there any way around this? one-to-many conundrum so that the unwilling listeners can seek relief from information uh, that they want to avoid. So I think so, but the trick is for the government to help unwilling listeners identify themselves and separate themselves from the other listeners. So in other words, these, this one-to-one, one-to-many distinction um, is not static, and the government can, can um, create some efforts to help convert the latter into the former, and then regulate if, if they want to. So they can do this in a couple ways. Um, the strongest form would actually require speakers to inquire about the listener's preferences, but this is obviously quite onerous for the, for the speaker, and I'll come back to that in a minute. A weaker form might be to facilitate unwilling listeners to just self-identify and uh, you know, for the government to provide some sort of notice mechanism uh, so that unwilling listeners can identify themselves to the speakers. Uh, something equivalent to the remove me from your mailing list sort of thing that um, is already facilitated. Uh, or it might even develop specialized list of lack of interest, like the, if the FTC put together a no pregnancy list, then, um, then uh, companies selling uh, or sending relevant material could consult the list before they do. 
So once these unwilling speakers have identified themselves, I'm sorry, these unwilling listeners have identified themselves, the government can either ban the communication to unwilling listeners or allow norms to do the work for them. The strongest form where, uh, where the separation requires the speaker first to inquire, <clears throat> and then if the, if the listener is not interested, the, the speech is banned. Um, that describes like the, when, when the doctor must ask, you know, do you want to know your HIV status? And if the patient says no, well then the status can't be revealed. Right? Uh, so these systems w would help isolate um, the, un the one to one um, communications to unwilling listeners and then, and then facilitate a ban. Uh, but I don't want to skate over the potential First Amendment problems here, to, at least not too quickly, because this process of separating communications uh, into one-to-one, -one, into a series of one-to-one -one links, uh, is itself potentially problematic. And then, and then the ban itself, too, um, has, has more problems than it uh, let on at first. Um, so for the first step, the the First Amendment inquiry really can't ignore the burdens of converting one-to-many speech into a series of one-to-one -one communications. Um, so the costs are somewhat dependent on the technology involved. Some technologies make it very simple for a listener to screen out messages that they don't want so that, so that it doesn't make any sense to impose costs on the speaker to do the sorting. But for other technologies, listeners cannot effectively screen out unwanted content, and, and speakers could do it, you know, perhaps could do it very easily. Um, so the First Amendment has some role to play in, in figuring out whether uh, the costs that are imposed on the speaker are appropriate. The second step, though, the speech ban, um, causes more problems. So I'd been working under the assumption this whole time um, that these communications to unwilling listeners uh, are not and should not be as zealously protected by the First Amendment, but let's think through for a minute why that should be. Um, well, it turns out that I think there are really only two scenarios in which these types of communications are wasteful. One is where the speaker doesn't realize that the listener doesn't want to know something about himself. Uh, so this category should diminish just from the first step without requiring the ban afterwards, right? So once the speaker realizes, um, the, the speech should, uh, should die on its own. Uh, the second category, though, is where the speaker does know that the listener doesn't want to know something about himself, and the speaker wishes to tell the listener anyways out of pure spite. So this, is, this would be a form of harassment, and I think it ought to be treated as a harassment law um, where courts often do, prob um, pro probably wisely, um, uh, discount the value that the speaker gets in, in, in harassing the, uh, the, the listener. But for the rest of these unwelcome communications, they fall somewhere in a residual category where the speaker knows that the listener might not want to know something, might prefer ignorance, and yet they want to pass the information along anyways, uh, either out of the interest of the listener himself or some third party. So let's revisit the HIV screening law for just one more minute. Uh, so if a doctor suspected or knew that his patient had HIV or some other dangerous communicable disease, um, he may have ample reason to inform the patient despite the patient's preferences to stay ignorant. Right? So the information might be more useful than the patient himself realizes if there are um, new, new therapies that the patient doesn't, uh, isn't aware of. Um, and of course, even if it's even if it's unambiguous that this is going to be bad news for the patient and that it will make the patient's life worse, the doctor still might prefer to disclose the information so that the patient uh, is more likely to engage in safe sex, safe sex or, um, or at least disclosing his status to his or her status to sexual partners. Um, so indeed, the, the, in fact, the third party interests here are so compelling that the New York public health laws have this bizarre paradox built, built into their HIV statutes. So a doctor cannot screen a patient without the patient's permission, even when the patient is showing symptoms. But if a patient does agree to the test and it has, comes out positive, then suddenly the law springs onto the doctor a reporting requirement where the doctor must ensure that all of the patient's uh, past sexual partners are informed that they have been exposed to HIV. Uh, so I think this you know, schizophrenia shows that there are more things at work here, rather that, that the interests of the third parties, of the speaker, and even of the listener himself, sometimes aren't fully captured by a listener's willingness or unwillingness to hear some, some new information. Okay, so the, so the larger implications aren't really great for privacy, right, because um, as I'm saying here, that even in this narrow category of, of privacy and dignity interests, the government, if it's interested in helping, coming to the def 
coming to the rescue of a, an unwilling listener, it needs to first, it should first try to help listeners sort themselves uh, before actually imposing a ban. Uh, but I do want to close with one area related to self-ignorance where privacy and First Amendment can and frequently do pull in the same direction. So that's where the speaker doesn't want to speak, the listener doesn't want to listen, but the government coerces the conversation or the communication anyways. Um, so one example is the law in New York City and elsewhere that requires fast food restaurants to put their calorie counts uh, on, on menus so you know how bad the Frappuccino is for you. Um, so this type of information is unwelcome to some who would rather enjoy their pastry uh, in peace. Uh, but, uh, but, but the challenge, you know, if, if this were to be challenged under the compelled speech doctrine, it would be a bit difficult for the restaurants and unwilling listeners too because some of the listeners are willing and those are the listeners that the government here are, is trying to support. Um, so we might have an inverse of, of the diagram that I showed you earlier. But consider now laws in, in two states, at least, that require abortion providers to perform a sonogram uh, on their patients and, and to even describe the image if the patient refuses to watch the screen. Uh, so these are one-to-one -one communications. Uh, and when the patient objects, at least, this is the government forcing a message where no participant to the communication is actually willing. Right? So if the willing-to-willing -willing link was at the center of the standard speech model, uh, I think we should start seeing the unwilling in unwilling link as the center of the um, of the compelled speech doctrine, uh, where you know. So as long as speakers want to respect the listener's preference uh, for ignorance, the government should have to have a very good non-ideological reason uh, before imposing knowledge. All right, that's it. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, so I come at this topic from a slightly different perspective than everyone you've heard from so far in that I am not a law professor. Uh, I'm a practicing lawyer. And uh, my practice focuses on cases before the Supreme Court of the United States. And uh, one reason that's convenient here is that, you know, everything we know about what the First Amendment means, we get basically from the Supreme Court uh, and from the lower courts. And so what I'd like to talk about today a little bit is how uh, Supreme Court opinions, uh, you know, come into being, uh, for those who don't know what goes on behind the scenes a little bit, uh, specifically for, you know, with some insight into First Amendment opinions, although I don't have any particular expertise into that area of law. And then I'd like to talk about a few First Amendment cases and how Supreme Court opinions get then subsequently interpreted by the lower courts in ways that are kind of messy. And I think the First Amendment is an area of the law that lends itself to this messiness for, for a couple of reasons. You know, I think that the First Amendment, um, first, you know, everyone loves it. Uh, the First Amendment is like everybody's favorite amendment. You never meet people who really hate it. It's not like the Second Amendment, which some people are very skeptical of. It's not like substantive due process. It's really everyone's favorite. And that, in large part, I think, is because people tend to imbue the First Amendment with uh, all of their own ideals and aspirations, you know, civic discourse, freedom of thought, freedom of conscience, you know, you name it, and you can find a place in the First Amendment to put it, and you can find a way that the First Amendment supports it. All of our highest democratic ideals live there. And, uh, and so I think, you know, people are very respectful of it and they're very eager uh, whenever possible to co-opt it um, and to claim, you know, and, and sometimes this is, you know, for lack of a better word, opportunistic or cynical, but a lot of times it really is just you have your philosophy and you, you think the First Amendment is utterly consistent with it because your philosophy is amazing and the First Amendment is amazing and therefore <laughs> they must completely overlap. Um, you know, and this is true, obviously, of, of all of us, but it's also true of Supreme Court justices and judges in the lower courts. And, uh, and so, you know, the other thing that I think makes the First Amendment inherently susceptible to messiness is that, you know, there are a lot of, like, squishy categories and blurry lines in the First Amendment. So just to take a very basic one, you know, what is the line between speech and conduct? It's really not very clearly defined, and people have to figure that out, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis. Other tests use terminology that's inherently very, very amorphous. You know, what is a substantial government interest? You know, I don't know. Um, <laughs> and, you know, how you distinguish between these things. And there's some refinement that goes on over time, but it's all very gradual, and it all, you know, 
necessarily judges will bring their baggage in when they make these sorts of determinations. And so often we use the same words, but it's not altogether clear that we're talking about the same things. Um, and that, I think, lends itself to a lot of messiness, a lot of disagreement. Um, going back to how the Supreme Court works a little bit, uh, you know, the way cases are decided is uh, obviously, you know, uh, a petition comes before the court raising a particular question. It's granted. The case is then briefed and argued. And then shortly after the argument, usually a couple days, uh, the justices will go into a private conference where they will have a tentative vote about the outcome of the case. And then the, the duty to write the opinion will be assigned uh, by the senior most justice in the majority. Um, so, you know, if it's the chief justice is in the majority, then he'll always assign the opinion, and if it's not, then, then someone else will. And they, they try to spread around the work a fair bit, but also I think the degree of interest that justices show in particular issues, you know, is often represented a, a little bit in, in who gets what opinions. Um, that justice will then basically go forth and write the opinion, and drafts will be circulated, and comments will be made, but by and large, the comments are relatively light. Um, and there are any number of reasons for this. You know, one, the, one reason, and I think it makes a lot of sense if you think about it, you know, imagine nine very intelligent, very opinionated people all fighting over how to write every word of an opinion. It would be a total disaster. And uh, so they don't do that. You know, what they do instead is that they, they respect the assigned justice's role as the primary author of the opinion. And, you know, the rules, uh, the part that might get the most sort of heavy commenting is the rule itself that is proposed because, you know, there may be inadvertent consequences. But even, even there, you know, you, you see a lot of deference. And so what often winds up happening is that the same test or what is ostensibly the same test may be phrased slightly differently in a series of opinions and you know that uh, the court may mean nothing by it the authoring justice may mean something by it but it won't really get changed and you know a big part of this also is that the Supreme Court is not bound by its own precedent the same way that other courts are bound by Supreme Court precedent, right? If a Supreme Court case goes one way on one set of facts, and, you know, a year or two later, another opinion in the same area could, could work out a little bit differently. And so there's a little bit of looseness that goes on in the drafting of opinions. They reflect an individual justice's style. They reflect, you know, and also all of the baggage that they're bringing into the First Amendment with them, just like all of us bring our baggage. Um, the lower courts, though, don't have that kind of freedom. When the lower courts look at a Supreme Court opinion, they have to treat it pretty much as gospel, right? That's what binding precedent is. And so, you know, they are left to wonder, you know, are these subtle changes over time actually a sea change in the law? Or are they just, you know, rhetorical flourishes? What about sentences that aren't the rule? What about language that is, you know, is this dictum or is this, you know, essential to the holding? Well, I really don't know. And a lot of circuit splits form over this. Um, and, you know, I think one thing that goes on in the lower courts as well is there's this Rorschach effect. You know, you look at not just the First Amendment itself, you look at a Supreme Court opinion setting forth First Amendment rules and principles and applying them to particular facts, and you see in many ways what you always saw. You know, sometimes you just got reversed, and so you can't do that. But, you know, overwhelmingly, if that's not, if it's not you getting reversed, you know, you have a chance to kind of see what you wish to see. Um, so now I'm going to try to illustrate this concept in just a couple of ways. Uh, and the first will be by talking about a case I argued last term. This case is called Lane versus Franks, and it's about uh, a niche area of First Amendment law, which is public employee speech. Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes had this famous statement that a, a man may have a constitutional right to talk politics, but he has no constitutional right to be a policeman. And for a long time, this dictum was basically the touchstone of a rule that said, you know, you, your employer, if you're employed by the government, can fire you for something you say. Um, and it doesn't matter if what you say is, you know, I support the president or I criticize the president, whatever. You know, core political speech, you can be fired. Um, no protection. That all changed starting around the 1950s. There were a couple of cases about loyalty oaths, uh, which the Supreme Court held unconstitutional. Public employees were being required to swear their allegiance, you know, to the United States and to disavow, you know, communist ties and so forth. And, and so that provoked a bit of a backlash. And the Supreme Court said, no, that's unconstitutional. When those, when that loyalty 
loyalty affirmation has nothing to do with whether this person can do the job. You know, this is just bizarre and you shouldn't have it. The, the doctrine continued to evolve. In the 1960s, there was a case called Pickering versus Board of Education where uh, a teacher named Marvin Pickering sent a letter to the editor. It was this sort of half-cocked, ranting letter uh, with some inaccuracies in it where he was criticizing the budgeting process and claiming that the school district privileged academics, uh, uh, athletics over academics and raising a, a series of other complaints. And he was disciplined for that letter and he sued and he managed to win as well. And the new rule after Pickering was that when a public employee speaks out on a matter of public concern, and that was broadly undefined, so there's another squishy category for us, um, then the employer cannot discipline the employee unless it has a reasonable prediction that the speech will be disruptive or the speech has actually been disruptive in the workplace. Now this was still generally, you know, at the time it was written, I believe the Supreme Court thought it was issuing a relatively modest ruling that would be actually quite generous to employers uh, and give them a lot of leeway in predicting disruption. In practice it didn't really play out that way and over time you saw more and more cases, Supreme Court and lower court, where uh, steadily you know, the employee speech rights kept getting uh, recognized and the employees kept winning these cases. That changed a bit in 2006 when there was a Supreme Court case called Garcetti versus Ceballos. And in this case, basically, there was a sea change in the law. So uh, in this case, a deputy uh, district attorney in Los Angeles named Richard Ceballos wrote a memorandum uh, to his superiors. He was working on a criminal investigation, and he believed that the officers in the case had committed misconduct, a Fourth Amendment violation, um, and that they had lied about it. So he writes this memorandum to his bosses and says, hey, you know, I think there was a Fourth Amendment violation here. I think we've got to drop these charges. Um, you know, this case is, is screwed. And his bosses look over all the facts, they talk to the relevant people, and they say, yeah, we disagree. Uh, we think this case can move forward. Uh, the, the case does move forward. There's a suppression hearing. Ceballos actually winds up testifying for the defense. Um, you know, his bosses are very upset with him. He is disciplined. Um, oh, oh, and by the way, the government wins at the suppression hearing, right? So Ceballos is, at least in the eyes of the court, wrong. Um, so he's disciplined and he brings uh, a lawsuit. He says, you know, this discipline was retaliation for my speech. My speech is clearly on a matter of public concern, uh, you know, of the highest public concern. We're talking about official misconduct here. Uh, and the, the case goes, uh, the Ninth Circuit actually agrees with him, but the Supreme Court says no. And the reason the Supreme Court says no is it says that basically when you are speaking in the course of your official duties, you get no protection. We're back to the to the old days for that subset of employee speech. And this this rule caused a bit of outcry. I actually think it makes kind of a bit of sense in, in many ways, you know, because so imagine I think the the best example of this would be imagine like the president's press secretary, right? The press secretary is always getting up in front of the media and saying things of public concern. But if he just goes totally off the rails, you know, and says a bunch of nonsense, um, the president should probably be free to fire him and should probably be free to do so even without you know, going through litigation where he must prove disruption uh, to the workplace. Uh, that's sort of what part of being the boss is, is you get to evaluate your subordinate's performance even when uh, that performance includes talking or writing. Um, so that was the rule that the Supreme Court basically adopted in uh, Garcetti. Um, but there was this straight, and, and so the language they used was, when public employees make statements pursuant to their official duties, the, employer, the employees are not speaking as citizens for First Amendment purposes, and therefore the First Amendment doesn't protect the speech. Um, but there was other language in the opinion that was less clear. There was language in there saying, for example, when speech owes its existence to the employee's job, uh, you know, it's uh, not protected. And... Uh, and so there was some confusion in the lower courts about, well, what do you do with statements like that? And so the 11th Circuit had this kind of odd rule that basically said that when you learn the subject matter of your speech at work, uh, it's not protected. Even So, you know, you could learn something at work, you could go home and you could talk to your, uh, your spouse, for example, about what happened that day. And even if the information is not confidential, you know, theoretically you could be fired because... You know, you learned it at 
at work. And you're obviously not speaking pursuant to your responsibilities there. Uh, so it was kind of an odd rule. And then there came the case of my client, Edward Lane. And so Edward was a guy who ran a program for at-risk youth in Alabama and was overseen by the, the community college system in Alabama, which had its own little corruption scandal. And part of that scandal was uh, a practice called double dipping, whereby state legislators would also get themselves second jobs working in public departments. And, and you know, this isn't crazy because the Alabama state legislature doesn't pay people enough that they can, you know, just do that for a living. They have to get other jobs. But the issue was that a lot of them were creating other jobs for themselves, some of which did not necessarily require them to show up. And so there was a woman <laughs> uh, named Sue Schmitz who did precisely that. And she set up a nice office for herself that she never went to uh, in this program. And she was paid six figures uh, to do it. And so my client, became the director of the program and he discovered her uh, absence and he was doing an audit of their finances because they were running out of money. And so he calls her, he says, hey, do you want to do some work? She said, no, not really. And he said, okay, you're fired. Uh, and so she's fired. Now, the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, took notice of these proceedings and they decided to indict her for fraud. Um, you know, she had a colorable defense to this allegation. She said, look, I'm, I'm really, really bad at my job, but that doesn't mean I've committed federal crime. Um, you know, it's not a crazy thing to say, but the jury didn't believe it. The 11th Circuit didn't believe it either. She went to jail for a while. Um, my client testified both to the grand jury and at her criminal trial, and he basically related the events that happened that caused him to discover her transgressions and ultimately terminate her. Uh, he was subsequently fired from his job. Uh, after her first trial resulted in a mistrial, he got let go. Uh, her second trial resulted in her conviction. Didn't do much for him. So he brought a lawsuit saying, you know, my, uh, my termination was retaliation. And under this 11th Circuit rule, they basically said, no, your subpoenaed testimony doesn't count uh, as First Amendment protected speech for two reasons. Uh, and, and the reasoning is really not unclear. So I'm, I'm doing the 11th Circuit a big favor by, by giving you its reasons, because it's not clear that it had any. Um, <laughs> the... The first reason was, you know, this speech was subpoenaed testimony. It was not, the, you didn't volunteer it. And so it's not the sort of core First Amendment speech where a guy is like just expressing his opinion out on the street. This is crazy. There is no rule that says that, you know, if you speak under oath in court, it's outside the scope of the First Amendment. They made that up you know, to the extent they said it. Um, the, the second argument was basically what I had said before, that because everything he talked about were events that happened at work, it's basically the same as if he just did his job. And that obviously is not true for the reason that I gave, you know, that spouse example. So we got the Supreme Court to hear the case, and then the Supreme Court ruled unanimously, more or less. It was 6-3. There were three concurring justices, um, no dissents, uh, that, that we were right about the First Amendment. But now, in Justice Sotomayor's opinion, the test from Garcetti is phrased slightly differently. It says now, the First Amendment protects a public employee who provided truthful sworn testimony compelled by subpoena outside the course of his ordinary job responsibilities. And that word ordinary is new. It wasn't in Garcetti. Garcetti said when you speak pursuant to your official duties, it's not protected. It didn't say anything about ordinary or extraordinary duties. Uh, they actually got that word from us. I put it in the question presented uh, when I did the cert petition and the merits brief, because uh, I thought it would be nice. And, uh, <laughs> And so now it's made its way into this opinion. And now the lower courts are kind of spinning their wheels a little bit about, well, what the heck does this mean? You know, does it mean that if an employee is just, you know, called to testify once and it's kind of a one-off weird thing that, uh, that it would still be protected even if, you know, he ordinarily testifies, maybe it wouldn't be. They don't really know. Uh, and they're trying to figure this out and there, is, there could be another circuit split and I might get to argue another case about this. But... Um, <laughs> You know, but that's a, a, an example of how this is all gone. You know, you see these squishy categories in Garcetti and they don't quite work out and the courts try to muddle through them. They go totally off the rails sometimes because they have this idea of what, you know, kind of speech should be protected or not protected. And I think the 11th Circuit's decision is largely influenced by, you know, their a sort of hangover from the Holmes dictum. And now you've got this new language in Lane that might just be a little bit more uh, friendly to the employees. And so you've got other courts that are now wondering like, hey, what can we do with this? And you know, that's gonna happen a lot in First Amendment cases. It's gonna take a lot of Supreme Court cases to resolve this. Uh, how am I doing on time? Am I way over? You'll be fine. 
Cool. Uh, so now, you know, I want to talk about another case, and this one might be fun for uh, the internet savvy crowd. You know, the justices are not terribly internet savvy, which makes these cases always like real, real nail biters for the rest of us. Uh, <laughs> this is a case called Alonis versus United States, and this is about a guy who posted a bunch of threatening or uh, arguably threatening stuff uh, on his Facebook page about his wife. Uh, so they were having you know, marital problems, uh, and he uh, he posted a series of uh, some of them he calls raps. Now, I'm a fan of the hip-hop genre. I think it's generous to call this rap, but okay, fine, let's call it rap. You know, some of the stuff was just a bit of nonsense, so like, you know, he, he starts, and so here's, I'll just read part of one of it, you know. Did you know that it's illegal for me to say that I want to kill my wife? It's illegal. It's indirect criminal contempt. It's one of the only sentences that I'm not allowed to say. Now, it was okay to say it right then because I was just telling you that it's illegal for me to say I want to kill my wife. <laughs> I'm not actually saying it. I'm just letting you know it's illegal for me to say that. It's kind of like a public service. And it goes on and on, and, you know. <laughs> and what's interesting is that it's very illegal to say that I really, really think someone out there should kill my wife. You know, it's very illegal. And, you know, he goes on for a while. Anyway, federal prosecutors were not amused. They did charge him under 18 U.S.C. 875C, which says it's illegal to transmit in interstate or foreign commerce any communication containing any threat to injure the person of another. This statute has been construed, uh, has been narrowed by the Supreme Court in an opinion called Watts versus United States, 1960 case where they said it encompasses only true threats. Um, again, super squishy, what the heck does that mean? Um, there was a case in 2003 called Virginia versus Black where the Supreme Court says a truth True threats are those statements where the speaker means to communicate a serious expression of an intent to commit unlawful violence. And you know that language uh, has been interpreted by many courts to mean there is there must be subjective intent to threaten. Uh, the person making the statement must actually mean to make a threat, not just that a reasonable person in the position of the listener would feel threatened or that a reasonable person making the statement would would you know regard it as a threat. But you know there was a circuit split about this because there were this hangover of old cases where adopting an objective standard, then they looked at Virginia versus Black and said, eh, it's not so clear and we're going to stick with our rule. Uh, and so now the Supreme Court has another case about this. And, you know, we're going to see again what they say and who knows what they will say. Um, but it's going to be an extremely important case in this sort of era of uh, cheap speech, as Eugene described it, where people are making, and, and you know, this era of potentially lots of unwilling listeners where everyone is broadcasting, you know, tweeting, Facebook, rapping. Um, you know, I, it's going to be a, a really interesting test to see whether old First Amendment rules, you know, how they work in this new speech medium. Because, you know, one interesting fact about the case is that this guy and his wife were not like Facebook friends. So she didn't automatically get notification that he even said this. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, you can imagine if you're her, you read this, you would be a little bit freaked out. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's going to be an interesting case. It's, uh, the oral argument for the case just happened. The opinion is not out yet. And, you know, the oral argument, there's a clear range of views on the Supreme Court, any one of which could be adopted, all of which are likely to be squishy. Uh, and then we're going to keep having more work for us lawyers to do. So for those of you who are watching, you know, in the student crowd and you're kind of thinking, yeah, I might want to get into this, there's going to be a lot of business. Um, and so, you know, just stay tuned. Sorry, I was uh, trying to prepare some PowerPoints on the fly. Uh, so, and I think I've succeeded, but we'll see in a moment whether I have. All right, are we set? We're set. Uh, <clears throat> so it's a great pleasure to be a commentator on this panel. Um, one problem with data is sometimes you have a lot to say about some, uh, some uh, uh, of the presentations, less to say about others. So I, I wanted to say what I had to say and 
I'll leave it to you folks uh, uh, to decide. Um, I, uh, I thought the uh, talk about the right not to hear was extremely interesting, and I, and I agree in considerable measure with the basic principle that, well, I don't have a right not to hear things out in public. If I don't want to see a flag burning, I can't say I've got to stop this flag burning because I don't want to hear it. I should be allowed to say, you, you keep calling me. Stop calling me. Call other people. Put up billboards that inevitably I'm going to see. All right. But if you're calling me, I should be able to stop you from calling me. And in fact, uh, traditional criminal harassment law actually allows that and has generally been upheld, although some such laws have been struck down in some measure. Uh, and I think the difference between speech to a person versus speech about a person uh, is really quite important here. And unfortunately, some courts are losing track of it. But when it is speech to a person, I think it, there is, at the very least, a good reason to have a right to enlist the government to restrict unwanted speech from private speakers, especially when it's clear the speaker says, I don't want it. Not just you have to guess whether he wants it or not, but clear that I don't want it. Um, now, Jane, and I think uh, specifically mentioned that there are two things, though, in play here. There's a possible right to enlist the government to restrict unwanted speech from private speakers. But there might also be a right to block unwanted speech from the government. Justice Douglas touched on that actually in an even broader context in a case called Pollock in the 1950s. But uh, uh, that is, I think, particularly one of the things that is condemned as to the laws that require doctors to show a woman the um, uh, sonogram of, of, the, of the fetus that she's contemplating aborting. Uh, and I think there, too, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting and plausible argument, although now we're moving to a different area. Now we're moving uh, not just a question of, of uh, uh, when the government may restrict speech, but when the First Amendment itself restricts government speech. It's generally thought to rarely do that, but maybe this is an area that it could. I just want to flag, though, the various situations in which this can arise, and it, just because I think it highlights the importance of what Jane is talking about. So for example, California law has required sexual harassment training. The careful reader, reader would realize this is probably sexual harassment prevention training, although that is the label. <laughs> I've seen signs, <laughs> sexual harassment training, this era. Uh, and the theory is if you want to reduce sexual harassment, you can, should require private employers to train their employees. Some private employers would do that in any case. That wouldn't pose any First Amendment problems if it's a private action. Uh, but what if they don't? What if they don't care or don't know enough about the risk of legal liability? We should make them do this. It's a, Perfectly plausible position. Note there is an ideological dimension to this, and at least certain kinds of training may not just be here's what the law is, but here's what's bad. It's bad to act in particular ways, bad to have certain attitudes towards women. To what extent does that become a kind of ideological message that the government couldn't be required to foist on people? Uh, in UCLA, there is now a requirement of diversity education that students take a class on diversity uh, with a topic of diversity. Uh, that's now being talked about by, within the university system. I'm sorry, is there a bottle of water I could have? I'm getting dry mouth. Uh, all right, uh, I'll take the moderator system so I don't <laughs> take a fellow panelist. Uh, so, uh, and interesting, this is from the UCLA press release about this, that the proposal was prompted by a large and growing number of studies demonstrating university courses produce a more tolerant, less prejudiced student body. What they mean is, and I don't want to fault them for it, but more tolerant of some things and less tolerant of other things, more prejudiced. Uh, less prejudiced against some things, more prejudiced against other things, maybe perfectly proper. Maybe we should be less tolerant of some things and more prejudiced against others. But it's pretty clear there is something of an ideological dimension in some measure. Now, maybe the answer is this is the government acting as educator. Of course, the point of a university is to teach students, including teaching them some things they may not want to learn about. They may not want to learn calculus, but damn it, learn calculus, they will. I don't see much ideology of this, but maybe because I'm just a math buff and I don't see, uh, I don't see how people might object. But, but this is an interesting question. Maybe, again, you say rules are very different when the government is acting as college educator, but worth flagging. What about required vaccine information? I don't have any such requirements. What if doctors are required to tell parents, look, here are all the reasons you should vaccinate? And the parents say, I just don't want to hear about it. No, 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 we want to really tell you this. Partly for your sake, partly for the sake of your kids, partly for the sake of other people and their kids. What about required disclosure about ways of ameliorating or accepting a potential child's disability? What if, for example, the requirement isn't just, is, or isn't even at all, here we'll show you uh, the, um, the, uh, uh, um, uh, the image of the, of the fetus in utero, but uh, you know, we, know, when we know that you're contemplating aborting this child because of these birth defects, but we just want to tell you that uh, some of them are actually a lot more fixable than one might think. 
And others, you know, kids could live really happy lives with Down syndrome. It sounds tragic in, uh, in, in many ways. It is, but my understanding actually is that many uh, people with Down syndrome, they, they, appear to be, they appear to be quite happy. And some people, I think, uh, who, who think about it in terms of the rights of the disabled say, you know, at the very least, maybe we can stop abortions of people who have, uh, uh, or of, 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 of abortions of, uh, that, uh, of uh, fetuses that would eventually grow up in people with, with people with disabilities, but at least we could just kind of try to dispel some of what we see are misconceptions, although others may not see as misconceptions about that. What about required parenting classes? Generally not, uh, not generally required, uh, unless somebody has shown some real problems with parenting, but what if there were? An, uh, I wonder how that would play out. Or required classes for divorcing parents. I think there's some suggestion that if there's some trouble in the divorce, some tension, especially when kids are involved, you could send parents to, to, to such required classes. What if somebody says, I don't want to learn that stuff? I mean, maybe if I actually misbehave, then you can force me to do something as punishment, but I don't want to have to learn that. What if parents in cross-racial adoptions, for example, were required to, to hear certain things uh, about how to make things better for their children? Note, the court has always said there's no right to an adoption. There's no constitutional right to an adoption, but would it be an impermissible, uh, an impermissible um, uh, uh, unconstitutional condition? So that's a, those are some questions I have to ask just because they were prompted by, uh, uh, by um, uh, hearing Jane's very interesting pre um, uh, presentation. Uh, I, I very much appreciated uh, Tejinder's uh, uh, presentation as well. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned Garcetti and Alonis, which are very interesting cases. I will say in the court's, in the court's favor, these are unusually difficult questions, I think. Uh, one of the problems is uh, Tejinder, I think, correctly identified that Gar Garcetti, though the results seem really quite unappealing to many justices, to many people, and were to four of the nine justices. Here's this person who seemed to be really trying to blow the whistle on behavior, bad behavior by the sheriff's department. He's a prosecutor. It's his job to try to promote justice. How is he getting demoted for that? Well, Tejinder points out, look, you get to evaluate your subordinate's performance, even when the performance involves talking or writing. If your subordinate is a lawyer, you've got to be able to say this this motion is just badly written or badly reasoned, or maybe this memo is just, it's unproductive. You think you're, you're tell, speaking truth to power, but really you're just ruining the relationship with the very people whose behavior you want to change. The problem is that all sorts of government restrictions in employee speech will often be justifiable on some such basis. Oh, you wrote this letter to the, to the editor. Well, it just shows that you're a fuzzy thinker. We don't want a fuzzy thinker in this job. Uh, so it's just very difficult. The court has struggled quite hard with government as employer's speech, and I don't think it's done struggling, and I just think it's a difficult question, and I think it's unsurprising. Courts have trouble with it. A similar issue is true with true threats, although less because of the doctrine and more because of how you interpret speech. Pretty much everybody accepts that at a certain point, whether you have a broad view of, view of free speech or narrow view of free speech, you're going to have a lot of speech be protected, but at some point it becomes a threat. And what makes it a threat? How do you know whether it's a threat? How can you figure out? How can people predictably identify whether what they say will be threats? I think those are just difficult questions. So let, let, me, turn, let me turn finally to the first paper. And it reminded me of this very, interest, very, very funny cartoon that many of you have seen probably. So there's an American Indian standing there, presumably 1492, maybe 1608, saying, oh, no, not more illegal immigrants, looking at, uh, at the white ships. And you know, you gotta really sympathize with the guy, right? Uh, uh, here's another one, illegal immigration, unless you're related to these guys, shut up about it. <laughs> Very similar tone. I like this last one in particular because it's rare that you have quite as uh, uh, strong an illustration of the famous Ring Lard line, which is, shut up, he explained. Uh, uh, but if you go back to this, I think the heart of this message, which I, I'm pretty confident that this was intended as a pro-immigrant rights, an anti-anti-illegal immigration, a cartoon is, look, Oh, you guys, your ancestors came here. In my case, I came here. Your ancestors came here. Many of them came here even though the Indians would not have liked them to come here, but they came here. How are you closing the door uh, on people when the door was open for you? That's just not right. That is hypocritical. It's just not right. There's another, in a different context, there was a line to agree with it or not. Uh, somebody was saying that uh, in, uh, the, in the mountains, the environmentalist is the guy who built this cabin last year, and the developer is the guy who wants to build this cabin this year. Uh, so there's this, and it's a very powerful moral argument, right? Look, you should be able, you should give other people the benefit of the same, uh, the, the same opportunities that you were given. I think it's a very powerful moral argument. There's, of course, also the other argument, the pragmatic argument, which is, 
This guy was right, right? Not more illegal immigrants. The illegal immigrants, and obviously weren't illegal in any traditional sense, but certainly immigrants who were unwanted by the natives, came, they brought disease, they uh, 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 brought violence, they brought just large numbers, they brought uh, uh, a, uh, um, uh, a lot of their descendants, and as a result, this culture, these nations are gone. In large measure, they're gone. Uh, the country was taken over. And presumably, if there was a way to keep the illegal immigrants out, I could certainly understand why the, uh, why the Indian tribes would have, would have uh, uh, wanted to do that. And the message that I think many who are skeptical about immigration, legal but especially illegal, is to say, look, yeah, it may seem harsh for us to close the door once our ancestors got in, but that's the smart thing for us to do. The, that, you know, we're not worried about quite the same numbers relative to us of immigration. Uh, we're not quite as worried about communicable diseases, which is a lot of the work uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, 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 destroying American Indian culture, but we're worried about these kinds of things. We don't want to go the way of the American Indians. We don't want our culture to be usurped and be taken over this way. By the way, probably more of an issue in Europe where a lot of the countries are smaller and less populous and a lot of the surges of immigration are considerably larger as a fraction of the population. So there's a really serious debate, it seems to me, to be had about illegal immigration and about immigration more generally. I actually quite support broad immigration. I think, I think that, the, that uh, if for preserve American national greatness, uh, it is something that, and preserve our standard of living, we should be having not 300 million people, we should be having 600 million. There's a reason why India and China matter a lot to the world, and it's because they're very large. I think over time we should be seeking, oh, seeking to grow our population. I'm not sure I would, oh, in fact, I'm sure I wouldn't do it through completely open borders. Uh, among other things, there are very many people who would want to come in those circumstances, but certainly various kinds of immigration I think would be very, very helpful. And I think most illegal immigrants, even though they are here illegally, you know, they're just here, they just want a good life for themselves and their kids, and I, my heart has to go out to them. And yet, as I said, there's a serious debate to be had about what the consequences of this are. And this is a debate that sometimes is nasty, as many debates often are. And I think shut up about it isn't really the right answer. Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about the arc of speech restriction. I, I had a, ch good, a chance to read the uh, professor's paper uh, um, earlier. And it starts out with an interesting example. Campus speech goes that penalize insults. And it sounds like personal face-to-face -face insults individualized insults. And it suggests that actually under existing law, by doing some, uh, by uh, following the particular cases, actually those kinds of speech codes should be constitutional. I don't want to get into the case law. But it's interesting, this starts out with the insults, personal insults. And I think it closely tracks Professor Delgado's, uh, uh, the article I think made Professor Delgado famous in the early 80s, which talked about a tort cause of action for racist insults. And it talks about language addressed to a person by the defendant was intended to demean through reference of race, a reasonable person would recognize as a racial insult. So it starts with this kind of very low value speech, at least under many theories, speech that is just a personal insult. Where's the value of that? Especially, I mean, tying into some things that Jane said. If it just said to a person who doesn't want to hear it, whom are you going to persuade with that? And interestingly, in the Professor Del 1982 article, it stresses a racial insult, unlike the slogan in Cohen, it's just not political speech. Oh, thank you. Hmm, okay. Um, but then, but it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. Uh, one of the things, if I read the article correctly, that are counsels in favor is restricting some kinds of satire. If it's aimed downward, lambasting poor minorities uh, or other weak groups such as minority religions like Islam, uh, and restricting it to a narrower sphere of permissibility. So there is no blanket license to make fun of any target that entered one's mind. Very much a departure now from First Amendment law. It's not just you can't personally insult people, it's just there's some things you shouldn't say to satirize. There's, you shouldn't feel free to have a blanket license to make fun of any target that enters your mind, especially if it's a minority group. It's interesting, my sense was that uh, the professors had some very uh, uh, forceful criticisms of what they saw as historical and present defects in Southern culture. And I think they should be, of course, perfectly free to make those arguments. My sense, unless I'm mistaken, though, is that if somebody, under their vision, had forceful criticisms of, say, Islamic culture, well, then maybe all of a sudden that wouldn't be protected anymore. 
Maybe that's just satire or criticism aimed downward at weak groups and constitution or constitutionally unprotected. I wonder where Catholicism it had uh, talked about his history of anti-Catholicism, which I generally don't subscribe to, although there's much about the Catholic Church, both present and especially past, that is worth criticizing, and perhaps even about some aspects of Catholic culture. I wonder how they would view that, whether they viewed Catholic Church as as uh, downward or upward, so it's okay to criticize or not, or maybe it's okay to criticize the Catholic Church or make fun of it when it comes to its treatment of, say, women or, uh, or uh, uh, gays, but not in other contexts. It's a question I couldn't really fully answer from the paper. <laughs> Complained about various consequences of formalist free speech law, speakers feeling entitled to say whatever they chose or had heard about Latinos without repercussions, legislators, editors, and other policymakers feeling free to paint uh, Mexicans in various bad ways, certainly not ways I would endorse, but it does sound like, because we're talking beyond personal insults, we're talking about that formalist free speech law undermines what it sounds like to me. They see as wholesome restrictions on speakers generally, on legislators, on editors. They too, they too should be told to shut up about at least certain kinds of things. Uh, a multiracial, multicultural, more densely populated nation needs a more flexible free speech regime, they argue. Speech that disadvantages a discrete and insular minority, again, presumably Muslims, Query whether it's true as to Catholics, query what context that would come in, calls for more careful scrutiny, which I take it means for more flexibility for restriction. And they close with saying that they've written this article with the hope that explaining how the First Amendment has the potential to combine with regressive politics. So that regressive politics, certain views that they conclude, perhaps even correctly as a substantive matter or wrong, that's something that, you know, there should be reform about the degree to which the First Amendment protects regressive politics. That's a pretty ambitious view, it seems to me. I should tell you, I should tell you, uh, and I'm going to close with this. This is uh, uh, from somebody who I don't think was generally thought a fan of formalism. In fact, this is one of the leading legal realists of his day, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. I think he got this part right. I think he got this part right. I'd heard talk about the shrill, the dogmatic, the authoritarian. He was talking about people who really fit all those categories. These were the kind of the uh, communists of the, uh, and uh, general, let's say, sympathizers with the, with the communist revolution in, in Russia of the late 19-teens. I think those three adjectives describe most of them very well. Yet he thought that they were protected too. And not because it's somehow foolish to say, oh, we should restrict them. He starts out, this is from his famous Abrams opinion, not again a formalist position. Persecution for the expression of opinions is perfectly logical. If you have no doubt of your premises or your power and want a certain result with all your heart, you naturally express your wishes in law and sweep away all the position. Shut up, he explained. Perfectly logical position, perfectly logical. But he says, when men have realized that time has upset many fighting faiths, they may come to believe that the ultimate good desired is better reached by free trade and ideas, that the best trust for truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market. Note, unlike some of his critics and some people who quoted him, he never said it was a perfect test by any means. What he said was the best test. And the best is compared to what? The best is compared to what he was dealing with, which was the government having the power to say something, this fighting faith is true, and we're going to suppress contrary views. I think that was true with regard to the fighting faith of capitalism and attempts to suppress anti-capitalist speech. I think that's true with regard to fighting faith of anti-racism and attempts to suppress speech that are seen as racist or that on their face merely deal with illegal immigration but that the theory is that they have some sort of racist uh, uh, animus behind them. I think Holmes, as I said, not a formalist really at all. Got this quite right as a basic pragmatic point and that is, on which, that is what I will close on. Uh, time is not our friend for questions, but we would like to give each of the speakers a minute uh, to just respond to any of the other speakers. Eugene, you kept, you kept saying that, that uh, we should have a con conversation about, about immigration and its benefits and, uh, and, and so on. And uh, I agree, we, we, all, we all should. Uh, Gene and I uh, endorse that idea, but, but you, you, you got our point exactly wrong. We think that when that conversation takes place, and it is taking place right now in the, in the South, in barbershops and, and legislative chambers and every, everywhere else, the conversation is short, abrupt, and angry. It's, it's, it's formalistic. It's a habit of mind from, from First Amendment formalism in which the speaker find, goes down a checklist, finds, uh, asks this question and that question, and, and finding, oh, yes, they're illegal, stops. I mean, that, that's the end of it. 
um, when, it, when in fact uh, th there ought to be you know, 20 or 30 or a whole lot of contextual things and the, the history of the, uh, of the South with Latinos and so on that, that uh, play, in, uh, play into, into that co conversation. So it's not that we want to close off conversation, quite the contrary, uh, Gene, we, we want to broad, broaden it. We, we want a non-formalist uh, discussion of, of the benefits for a region from La Latino, Latino Im immigration. Uh, I should say, I'm certainly in favor of conversation. I'm certainly in favor uh, of non-formalist discussion. I didn't, but I don't really see that allowing people to speak freely means that, therefore, you can't have a conversation about immigration. I do think once you start talking about how one side, and it really is one side, should be, there should be First Amendment rule, or First Amendment rules that authorize governmental suppression, governmental restriction of speech on that one side. I'm not sure how that's going to make the conversation any less short, abrupt, or angry. I think that's going to make the conversation worse rather than better for the simple reason that when you shut people up, uh, when, you, when you are the government, I don't think that that has a pretty good track record, and I speak here not as a formalist, but, some, but as someone who, like Holmes, I think takes a functional view of the matter. You're right, if you shut people up, and that's exactly what goes on in Alabama. You shut people up, and there is no opportunity to talk back. Marketplace of ideas doesn't exist. It's always hard to close a free speech panel. <laughs> um, but thank you to all of our speakers. <laughs>